And the learning objectives for today is, that today is that we will review just briefly the scientific base of safeguarding in sport and spend a little bit more time on the clinical approach. So what is the role of the sport medicine physician and the approach to managing and um, uh, assessing and supporting our athletes that may have been uh, uh, survivors or victims, as you wish to say, of harassment and abuse in sport. So I'd like to start off with some faces and, and not to sensationalize things, but just to remind everybody of the reason we're talking about this topic is because it does happen. And these are some examples from around the world. The women on the top are, are Larry Nasser survivors and USA Gymnastics. And these are photos from the courtroom where they were giving their victim impact statements. We have from Africa. We have the um, allegations of uh, sexual abuse of a women's basketball team in Mali. In Asia, uh, we have the, the uh, uh, Human Rights uh, Watch pro uh, report from the uh, Taibatsu in Japan of the um, treatment of young children, of corporal punishment of young children in Japan in the sports system. And then in Europe, uh, the uh, football in the UK. So these are just some examples from around the world just to demonstrate to all of us that this isn't something theoretical in the science. This is actually, it happens. And it happens to our athletes in all sports from around the world. So I'm going to start off, as I mentioned, with what do we know? What should we know? And where will we go? So let's um, talk a little bit about prevalence first. And what we can see here is the tip of the iceberg in the science. We have a lot more work to do to look at prevalence more robustly. A lot of the publications are around incidents or case reports, and we have no studies on lifetime prevalence at the moment. We have some emerging evidence now on what, what aggressors um, or uh, perpetrators are and what a little bit about um, them. And most studies are across different sports and very few are in a specific sport. And there's very few that are multinational. And there are global gaps in part of the world in our knowledge of uh, the prevalence. Why do we want prevalence or why do we want reliable data? And I think it's really important to, uh, to have this science because the science base helps us set priorities. It helps guide our prevention programs and intervention programs. It monitors our progress and the advocacy itself helps to raise awareness and to actually um, advocate for action within the safe sport arena. And to um, quote um, Mark Hartle in the Athlete um, Survivor Voices project of his in 2019, information, information meaning science, puts pressure on not only individuals but sport organizations to identify the problems, work on them and then evaluate their success. So please, um, scientists in the, in the audience today, uh, please help us. And if you're not a scientist in this area and your approach to support research in your athletes or in your own practice, uh, please um, assist and support the research in this field. So a lot of the uh, uh, information I'll talk about today is embedded in this original um, consensus statement from 2016. Now, there is a prior one on sexual harassment from 2008, but the update and expansion of that original sexual abuse uh, consensus statement is the 2016 one here from the BGSM. And that document defines the term safe sport as being the athletic environment that is respectful, equitable and free from harassment and abuse. So I think a fairly standard um, uh, definition that we can all uh, strive for. That uh, statement also identified four different kinds of abuse and the underpinning abuse um, uh, that is most prevalent is psychological abuse. And that isn't someone, you know, that's just a one off, um, you know, grumpy day and feels upset by what someone said. It, it is a pattern of deliberate, prolonged, repeated non-contact behaviors and usually within a, a power differential relationship. So um, a senior athlete with a junior athlete, a coach, an athlete, a physician and an athlete. And this form of abuse really underpins and is the core for all other forms of abuse. The next one is physical abuse. And I think we can understand that as being the non-accidental trauma 
or physical injury. So in a team sport where there's um, checking and um, tackling, that is not physical abuse. That's part of sport, but it's the non-accidental, it's the intentful abuse where there's punching, beating, kicking, biting, etc. That is physical abuse. But in sport, we expand the diagnosis beyond that to be other um, forms of abuse that have physical repercussions, such as inappropriate physical activity, um, age, either age or ability inappropriate, training loads, um, age or maturational uh, inappropriate, or forcing someone while injured and in pain to continue to um, uh, train or compete beyond their level of uh, recovery from that injury. In hazing rituals, forced alcohol um, consumption and unfortunately systemic doping practices with physical outcomes, uh, as we know, is other another form of physical abuse. In here and not in this definition, and we've expanded it since, is to include physician abuse where you're um, uh, misprescribing medications or medical treatments to athletes that are that is inappropriate. Sexual abuse, I think we all can understand this one. It's a conduct of sexual nature being contact. Um, Non-contact would be harassment, contact would be sexual abuse where consent is either coerced, manipulated or not given. As in the case of a minor where uh, um, consent cannot be given because of lack of understanding of the concept. Neglect. Uh, the definition from outside of sport is the failure of parents or caregivers to meet a child's needs, physical or emotional needs to protect them from danger. And within the sport context, that includes coaches, athlete entourage, physicians, other people who are responsible for the health and well-being of the athlete. So it's a failure to protect them through neglect. And that isn't the final form. So here is the model, a conceptual model of harassment and abuse of how this happens in a continuum over time. So it starts within a climate where there's discriminations and over time the continuum can lead further towards harassment and abuse. And these discriminations happen within a cultural context within sport with these power differentials that I've mentioned. And these power differentials can be on the basis of many things where there's intersectionality of different ones or even just a single one. So it could be athlete ability where you have senior athletes on a team and junior athletes where some are a little bit more able. It may be longevity, so senior hasn't been around longer. It may be discriminations based on um, sex, sexual orientation, indigeneity, ability or disability, financial status. It can be any one or combination thereof. That then leads to the four types of abuse that I defined for you that are expressed through different mechanisms, be it contact, non-contact, through cyber, um, through cyberbullying per se, um, negligence or hazing. And then that leads to outcomes. And those outcomes can be for the athlete themselves or the victim or for the sport organization. So the athlete impacts are listed here and there's many domains and I will go into some of them in a bit more detail. And important to note that it's not just the athlete that suffers um, negative outcomes from these behaviors, it's also sport organizations. Significant loss of um, uh, confidence in the sport, a reputational damage. Players can leave early, so early um, retirement or um, attrition of athletes. Um, and loss of fans, loss of sponsorship, which is subsequent to that, and reduced um, ability to have um, trust from the public and asset depreciation. Let's spend a little bit more time also on athlete impacts. I'll come to them. But before I do that, I want to touch on some, some prevalence. And the three blue ones are Canadian ones, so I'm um, talking about my own country here. An earlier study by uh, Sandy Kirby, 2000 showed that 23% of our elite Canadian athletes had had intercourse or with a person of a, a position or authority over them. That's a really high number and one that is not necessarily replicated in more recent data, but that was one of our initial um, uh, shocking moments in uh, our history. In uh, 2012, this is a study on um, prevalence of uh, youth athletes in Canada, and it was around 2 to 8 percent of children in sport were victims of sexual abuse, so slightly lower than the 2000 study. And then if we look at a um, more recent study of 2019, and again, this, is a, this one is a retrospective survey, 
you can see the numbers in the bottom corner there. But let's look outside of Canada because there's other countries that have this. The one of Denison and Kitchen on the top that I show in 2015, this one is, a, is specifically looking at homophobia um, in sport, and it's quite significant. 81% of homophobic phobia in sport in this cohort with 70% feeling unsafe. Now, that's a large cohort of 10,000 athletes. If we look at um, the bottom one, this is Sullivan study 2000, looking at ability or disability in sport, that the disabled athletes were 31% versus 9% victimized. So four times greater um, risk of, of suffering from harassment and abuse in our para athletes or disabled athletes versus our able uh, children athletes. And a very large uh, study from 2020 in Europe, um, a multinational study, Germany, Belgium, and, and uh, the Netherlands, showing a psychological abuse of 72%, sexual abuse of 31%. And this is a retrospective survey. Now, 72%, if we think of the prevalence of some of the sport injuries we deal with, much lower than this. And if we look at the money put into anti-doping for a much lower prevalence, why are we not acting at these very high prevalences, especially when we look at the impacts, negative impacts on, on athletes and sport organizations? So in the athlete I mentioned in a previous slide, but here in a little bit more detail, is the many different uh, aspects of an athlete's life that can be negatively affected by harassment and abuse. And I think it's important to know here that not all athletes respond the same way to harassment and abuse. And there's many different factors that go into um, the outcomes of what, what a person who's been through something will be. And it, it, it really depends on the type of abuse, the um, nature, the extent of it, how long it lasts, but also the makeup of that particular athlete as well. And you can see here that it can affect physical, their performance, their ability to, um, to work in their sport. Uh, or outside of sport, it can affect their relationships in their family or, or our friends, as well as cognitive and psychological health. Now, most athletes don't have all of these parts affected, but some may, and as I say, it varies significantly from athlete to athlete. And importantly, um, sometimes it's teammates of the victim that can be affected as well because they can see what's going on and are sometimes affected as well. So please don't forget teammates when we think of the outcomes. And here's a, an outcome from a Toffler study that the impacts of abuse on an athlete can often be devastating and long lasting long after the abuse ends. We think that when the abuse is finished, that the um, impacts on the athlete are done because they are now safe. But that's actually not true. And we sh it shows that the impacts can last well beyond uh, the um, actual abuse. And uh, this study um, by Tina Vertemann, she's a Belgian uh, researcher in the area, she's a criminologist, and she works solely in sport, uh, shows that the psychological distress in her very large cohort, again, a multinational cohort, showed that the psychological stress um, extended well into adulthood. And not only did they have the psychological stress, um, distress, they also had a self-reported reduction in their quality of life. So again, uh, just demonstrating the long-lasting impact of harassment abuse from a child. Uh, this athlete that I um, put on the screen here is, is not random. Sheldon Kennedy is an NHL player who's been very vocal about his experience of four or five years of, of quite um, prolonged repetitive sexual abuse by his coach. And uh, he, his, um, if you ever get a chance to read his book, it's a real eye-opener. And it's called Why I Didn't Say Anything. And it is, it's quite a good book if you get a chance to read it. Here's an earlier study, 2004, of a, a large cohort of child athletes, Jervis and Dunn, that showed some of the mental health impacts of children who experience um, abuse in sport. And you can see that there are many of them and the mental health ones can be very significant. There's a lot of them listed here. And uh, I, I do see clinically these um, mental health outcomes in athletes. And I think that's a really important thing for us to note here, that if you're seeing an athlete with mental health presentations, depression, anxiety, substance abuse, don't forget to ask them in your history around that illness of potential history of harassment and abuse. Because if we don't ask that, we could be missing it. 
very often athletes are shamed by their experience and they won't come out and say it unless we ask. And if we know of it, we can treat them in a different way to cope with that and um, process that abuse as opposed to someone who hasn't had that history. So it's a very important part of your history to ask an athlete. If we look at suicidal risk, here's a nice study from Sweden, athletic athletes showing suicidal risk. But importantly, and why I show it here is that in female athletes in this cohort of athletics athletes, the suicidal ideation was associated with a history of sexual abuse and psychological vulnerability in this cohort. So again, linking the history of abuse with mental health outcomes here. So um, a nice study by the group in Sweden. The same uh, cohort, uh, same uh, researchers, different study, looking at lifetime prevalence of sexual and physical abuse, uh, showing the sexual abuse higher in females than males at 16.2 to 4.3. And But not all of it's in the sports setting. So don't forget that our athletes have lives outside of sport and can suffer abuse um, in the non-sports setting, but still be impacted within sport in terms of their uh, behaviors and outcomes from that abuse. And that um, in the physical abuse of almost 20%, it was actually associated with a likelihood of injury in female athletes um, within sport. So if we are seeing an athlete with significant sport related injuries, are we asking our female athletes about a history of physical abuse? And maybe we should be. Now, um, a study that I had done in the YOG 2018 in Buenos Aires um, with the cohort. So this is a multinational elite youth, um, and this is real time, not in a retrospective survey, asking them to define the term safe sport. They had a real difficulty doing it. But when we defined it for them, over a half knew, and we're familiar with it, but almost a half, 46%, didn't, didn't, uh, weren't aware of what harassment and abuse were. And then when we ask them, well, now that you know what it is, is it happening in your sport? And just under half said no, which means the other half, over 50% um, said, well, you know, probably or I'm not so sure. So that was a bit alarming to us. And even more alarming is that over half, um, sorry, slightly under half, so about 37% didn't know what to do if, they, if it was happening. They didn't know where to go for help. Replicated the same study in the winter cohort in Lausanne 2020. Again, um, obviously different athletes because they were winter athletes and it was two years later, but we asked the same methodology. And again, this cohort didn't, uh, weren't able to define the concept of safe sport. They were thinking it was about safety, about anti-doping or following the rules. 10% said freedom from harassment and abuse. Yet when we asked them, um, when we defined it for them, about 70% actually said, oh yeah, yeah, I've heard of that. So it's it's not that they've not heard of harassment and abuse as they were familiar with the term, but still 31% were unfamiliar. And if we look at when we asked them if it occurred in their sport, 40% um, said no, uh, 31 said, yeah, likely it does happen and 30 were unsure. And in this cohort, 30% uh, didn't know where to go. So just slightly better than the summer cohort. So very similar findings between winter and summer athletes from around the world in the youth categories. I did a study in the FINA World Championships in Guangzhou 2019, uh, um, a slightly different methodology with this group and asked their experience of harassment abuse and 15% of this cohort said they had experienced harassment abuse. 9% they'd said, well, not me, but I've seen it happen in my um, teammates. And interestingly, the most common reported um, harassment abuse, we gave them a, a, a list, a smorgasbord, you say, of, of different forms, and 40% uh, were around body shaming and body appearance. So really important working with our elite athletes on how we approach body composition. And they define this as harassment and abuse. Um, there, are, there are many others in here. I've only listed a few here, but the 2.5% um, sexual abuse uh, was significant. And um, I did also a mental health uh, screen for depression and eating disorders in this study. And not surprisingly, but really interesting when it happens, is that the athletes who had experienced uh, harassment and abuse themselves had a higher average scores of depression and eating disorders and more than felt the need for psychotherapeutic for, uh, support when asked. And up to a third of them said they wouldn't talk to anybody if they saw or experienced harassment and abuse. And oh my goodness, this is shocking to me, less than 20% would actually go to an official for help. 
And you know what this means to me is that on our teams of athletes that we look after, there's a significant number of them that who are experiencing this and they're not talking about it. They will not book an appointment to speak to you about harassment and abuse. That's why you're maybe not seeing it, but if we don't ask about it, we're not going to find out about it because they hide it. They're shamed by it. So what are the impacts of medical abuse? So let's talk about it from our perspective as physicians. Well, I talked about the doping. There's also side effects from inappropriate medication abuse, and we have a lot of evidence of, of that in sport. There's risk from unnecessary interventions. So are we injecting too much? Are we, ex are we giving our athletes too many um, x-rays for radiation? Is there a risk of returning them back to play too soon from injury or illness because of pressures? And then of course, the most egregious one is physician sexual abuse. Well, maybe that's my, um, my judgment there, but I think we probably can agree that the case of Larry Nasser is something that um, is an embarrassment to our profession. And you will also perhaps recognize Grigory Rachenkov there, the gentleman who was um, the Russian uh, lab expert who was responsible or one of the members responsible for the systematic doping of um, athletes in Sochi. And you may also recognize the physique of an East German swimmer from the systemic doping in the East German regime. So what do we know about perpetrators? Well, we know that um, in Germany, uh, these perpetrators themselves had actually experienced sexual violence in their lifetime. Most of the reported perpetrators are male, but more recent evidence has shown that it can be male or female or a case of um, uh, both. Uh, in this, um, perpetrators have been identified as coaches, teachers, instructors. We know also physicians as well. And more recently, there's some emerging evidence that peer athletes are also perpetrators of abuse in sport. So how does it happen? And it really is around failed leadership where there's lack of policies and procedures, lack of reporting mechanisms, and lack of an identified person to look after this area of safe sport. So in an area where the perpetrator has high motivation, where the sport itself has low protection and high athlete vulnerability, this is the perfect recipe for harassment and abuse. And again, here's a quote from the um, uh, consensus statement. Abuse is nurtured in a culture where athletes are commodified in an environment that pursues winning at all costs, where athletes have no power and abuse is normalized or ignored. So here's some examples. And these are allegations um, of, uh, this is Mary Kane's story, win at all costs culture, and she, um, has had now a settlement on her abuse case against Alberta Salazar for body shaming and developing eating disorders and reds. We're very aware in professional sports of the coach abuse in, in many, and there's actually been a few more since I've done these slides of um, coaches in the NHL that have um, uh, been accused of, of harassment and abuse. This is another coaching for, uh, style of a, a toxic environment from a South Korean triathlete um, who committed suicide following her reports of abuse. And since then, there's been many people within the South Korean triathlon organization who have um, uh, had to resign and have been imprisoned because of this uh, athlete's experience. I mentioned briefly in the introduction about the culture, the culture within sport in Japan around youth athletes. This is a, you can Google this um, report from Human Rights Watch. It is, is um, an interesting report. Another of abuse of power. So this is uh, a, not so much about the, um, uh, well, it's an abuse of power of a coach over an athlete. And this is a, a very well-known case in figure skating in Europe uh, of coach abuse. And then I, I think we're all familiar with the Larry Nasser case of um, uh, gymnasts and young women in the United States. So let's move on to what should we do and uh, I think it's really important that all of us make sure that the sport organizations that we work have work in have safe sport policies and procedures. Make sure that the sport organizations we're involved in have a safeguarding officer that has the responsibility of this, this area. And we as physicians have a role in education. We educate our athletes about injury prevention. We educate them about the importance of nutrition. We educate them about 
sleeping well, but we also can educate them about safe sport to raise awareness and to help um, protect our athletes. And we can make sure that there's frameworks that are actually implemented, not just policies on a shelf, that we as physicians have a role here in leadership. And as I mentioned, supporting research to evaluate the efficacy of the implementation of safeguarding efforts. Also make sure that people and in, in, in are looking after athletes, so you and your physiotherapists and your teams have some skills in trauma informed care. And we want to be able to understand how to work with individuals who have been through trauma so that we avoid re-traumatizing these athletes. So what do I mean by trauma-informed care? And I think there's this is um, uh, nicely laid out in um, Hooper 2010, where it's first recognizing and realizing that trauma is out there. So when I mean trauma, I mean um, the effects of harassment and abuse. And when you look at the prevalence numbers that I gave you, it is out there. So we have to recognize that it's there in our athletes, even if we don't know about it. We should know how to recognize the signs and symptoms because it won't always be apparent. We should know how to respond appropriately and resisting re-traumatization through our actions and through our words. So this is a very important part that as a sport medicine physician, I was not trained in and had to gain this knowledge. So make sure that we have that trauma-informed care. And we should have the competence to recognize it, to manage disclosures, to know how to report and then treat and support. So using that medical um, framework of diagnosis, um, investigation and treatment, and I'll walk you through that. So how do we recognize the signs and symptoms? And let's talk first about our history. I mentioned already an athlete presenting with mental health system symptoms should be asked about a history of harassment and abuse either inside or outside of sport. That's part of your questions that you ask anyone around mental health. Please don't forget to ask about that as well. If you look at physical presentations, and now these are some of them, and I'm going to list them here, but not everybody who presents with these have had harassment and abuse. But if you see, see this, you can think about it in your differential diagnosis. And these are the illnesses that don't make sense. This might be individuals who present with more injuries than everyone else on the team, or injuries that just either don't make sense from the mechanism of injury or aren't getting better when they should be. And I've had a, a, one of my cases of a young woman, young, she was actually a youth athlete, who her physical injuries just didn't seem to make sense and um, she wasn't getting better. And, and when I finally, after months of working with this young woman, it came out that her, she was being sexually abused and her avoidance of her perpetrator was actually to have a sport injury so that after school she could come for physiotherapy instead of going home to her perpetrator. Her mother would pick her up from work and then she'd be safe to go home. So, you know, this is a, a case of abuse outside of sport, but the injuries weren't making sense. So think about this if things don't make sense. An athlete who is underperforming may have substance abuse or behavioral problems, the disruptive athlete. Are they just a problem athlete or is there a reason why they're being um, having behavior problems? Now, again, not everybody who's underperforming will have had sexual abuse and harassment. There's a differential diagnosis. What I'm saying here is please put harassment abuse on your differential diagnosis when you see these things. And please ask about it because they probably won't come forward with it unless you open the door ask about it and say to the athlete, if this is a safe space, if you ever want to talk to me about this, you can. And they may not then, but they may a month, a year down the road. So how do you manage this disclosure if it appears to be coming out? And I can tell you they won't book in for it. It'll be something that comes in the middle of your visit. And so I think it's really important to give the athlete permission to talk. If you if you shut off the conversation, I can guarantee you they will stop talking and you won't hear anything further. So give them permission, say it's a safe space. You can trust me. Please talk to me. Acknowledge their bravery, because I promise you it's very hard for someone to disclose abuse and harassment. They are embarrassed. They're ashamed by this and they're frightened. Acknowledge how brave they are to talk to you. Ensure their confidentiality within the limitations that you have because there are some limitations to confidentiality, especially in many countries where there's child abuse uh, that you are obligated in some countries to report. 
important not to demigrate the perpetrator because often that perpetrator is a very important person in their life, say their coach or someone in their life that has had good influence on them. Avoid leading questions. Let them lead the questions and you just reflect and clarify. You're going to have to put your pen down or move away from your computer and, and you know, talk to them, look at them, actively listen, and it's going to take you time. You're going to be late. It's worth your time to just stop and take the time and listen. Please keep accurate records because you're probably going to need them uh, as as processes um, move forward with in terms of um, um, uh, investigating the abuse and harassment. So as soon as the athlete is finished, please keep very good accurate records. But really important at that moment to make sure the athlete is safe. Make sure they're safe from their abuser. Make sure they're safe from self-harm at that point, because that's a critical, vulnerable time in that athlete's um, uh, health at that point. You must stop the abuse, because if you don't stop the abuse and it keeps happening, that athlete has just been told if they tell someone in a position of power about this and you don't stop it, then it's normalized and okay. And that compounds the psychological trauma for that individual. Report the abuse through the mechanisms in your sport organization. And then in treatment, make sure you look after the mental health as well as the physical health issues using a multidisciplinary team as needed. And as I mentioned, don't forget to support the family and the entourage. So in closing, I'll just talk a little bit about where, where I think this should go, uh, the um, field of safeguarding. And what action should we do? So we shouldn't be empowering our athletes' voices within sport organizations. And we should make sure that our leadership and sponsorship want to get involved in safe sport, because if it comes from the top down, it's more likely to have an effect. Everyone in sport should have some safe sport training in all of the organization. And I include in the safe sport training, um, trauma-informed uh, training. Make sure that we have a, a effective reporting mechanisms that go beyond our, our sport organization to being um, global. And I would absolutely uh, love to see that there be efficient remedy for victims, meaning those athletes who have suffered this have um, appropriate um, compensation for their experience and that uh, trauma informed support and care be available around the world and that there be uniform repercussions for perpetrators, much in the way there are uniform repercussions for doping around the world. They are the same under the WADA code. Why do we not have a global code for repercussions of perpetrators within the sport? And embedded in that would be an international offender list, so a perpetrator wouldn't just move to another country or jurisdiction to repeat the abuse. And I, I'm a firm believer in engaging survivors and safeguarding initiatives is healthy, not only for, for the survivor, but as well for the sport organization. And again, we need more research in the area.